because what you want out of life is happiness. And the reason why you were pursuing success is for that happiness. So if instead you say, okay, you know, if I want happiness in the end, why not focus on happiness to begin with? Then as a byproduct, you get success. <laughs> like the, there's a level where you go, I'm unhappy, I'm unhappy, I'm happy, I'm miserable, yeah. and then I'm desperate. And then when I hit desperate, that's when I go, all right, yeah. I'm going to fix this thing. Uh, how because having great relationships is so important for us as human beings. When we try to control other people, we mm -hmm. don't really get back love. Live with it. You almost tolerate burnout. You tolerate emptiness. You tolerate it for a while until you can't tolerate it anymore. Mm -hmm. You become very unhappy if things don't go your way rather than surrendering to the universe like an abundance oriented person might do and say that, look what I want. That's what a scarcity mindset does is that it closes you in. It increases mm. the chance of surviving, but reduces the chances of thriving. Um, well, but, you know, in, bi in biblical wisdom, that's very important as a matter of no, fact. Important. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See money, we, it gave us a boost in happiness levels and now we just keep chasing money. Yeah, yeah. It might yeah. Giving us happiness levels. Yeah. Important. Okay. The idea of being able to kind of control your mind and regulate your thoughts is super important in religions. And it turns out to be super important when you look at the literature here. Mm -hmm. The one, you know, if you think about the recipe for a happy life, it's actually very simple. Hey friends, welcome to Headspace. You're about to enjoy a fabulous wide ranging conversation with Raj Raghunathan. He is uh, a professor at Macomb School of Business in UT, teaches marketing, teaches a wonderful course on happiness. And um, he has some amazing res uh, research and insights into, into the space. And he also is the author of the book, If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Happy? Which is a great, very provocative, I think disarming uh, title. And he has fantastic insight about this, this stuff. Incidentally, this episode of Headspace is brought to you by Exponential Life, which is my coaching program where we teach happiness as a skill. And this is something that I am very, very excited about because as you can even see from the conversation with Raj, happiness actually precedes true success. And what we do oftentimes is in pursuit of what we think are going to make us happy, in pursuit of success, we actually lose happiness. And because we lose happiness, we eventually lose success, success as well. In this coaching program that I offer, we maximize success on a very sort of multidimensional level. Spirituality, love, prosperity, impact, legacy, mastery, fulfillment, all these things that actually matter, all these things that actually make you happy and make you better and make you more valuable to people around you. And we minimize suffering, things that plague us when we overinvest in stuff that just does not work. And the things that happen is we become stressed out, anxious, we feel a lot of pressure, feel a lot of burnout, overwhelm, emptiness, all of that stuff that oftentimes, oftentimes accompanies uh, strivers. People like myself, I've experienced that. And that's sort of what brought me to the deep study of human flourishing in the first place. And if you're one of those people uh, that are sort of in that space of high success, high stress, high unhappiness, um, and you want to get out of it, uh, please check out uh, the coaching prog program of Exponential Life, Exponential That Life, and uh, perhaps it's a good fit for you. Now back to our interview with Raj Raghunathan. I hope you enjoy it. Raj, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we're fellow Austinites, and uh, I, I was, I've been seeking to get your insight and your wisdom for some time now on the topic of the book that you have, a brilliant book. And uh, the, the title is, is, is amazing because I think it just cuts to the very core of people that are perhaps accomplished, successful. And the, the title is, If You're So Smart, why, you, why Aren't You Happy? And I just love the title because it disarms you immediately going, oh, I think you're right. Why are you asking this question? So thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you very much. It's interesting that you say that it's disarming because I've heard some people say that it's uh, too provocative. Um, oh, no, it's not. It's no. on you. You, you know, it, why aren't you happy if you're a smart kind of a thing? It's like a little bit provocative. But it I is. take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, but it's in a I think it's in a it's provocative in a good way because because you're right. I mean, you you know many successful people who are completely miserable. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually wondering what's the backstory? What's the what's the backstory for the book? 
I'm assuming mm-hmm. is is there's a few things there. Obviously, you've done a bunch of research. You're a professor at at UT here in Austin, Texas. Uh, but give me some give me give us some backstory. That'd be I'd love to hear that. Yeah, sure. So uh, there's no real backstory specific to the book itself. Uh, there's a backstory to how I got interested in happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, as a business school professor, usually you're not contemplating issues related to happiness. You're contemplating issues related to marketing or finance or accounting or information right. systems or management, mm-hmm. not so much happiness. Um, and the reason why I'll give you the short version of this. The reason why I started focusing on happiness is because I discovered that um, a lot of people in the business world, even though they might achieve conventional success, they might be powerful, rich, high in status and so on. Um, they may not necessarily be happy. And there seemed to be a little bit of a paradox there that people are really good at achieving their goals, right? Yes. Uh, Are not happy. And you would think that happiness is one of our most important goals. And yet there are these people who have achieved conventional success who are not very happy. So I wanted to kind of dig into that topic a little bit. Um, Not only was it academically interesting to me and intriguing, it was also personally relevant to me because I would put myself in that category of people about you know 15 years ago that had achieved a lot of success conventional success but not necessarily very happy and i wanted to kind of inquire into that topic so that's how the whole course that i teach at the university of texas came about my online courses on the topic came about and my book came about so there's no specific backstory to the book but there's a backstory to how and and as always i think with people who who choose to pick a topic or even teach a course it comes somewhat from a personal experience background right so so and i think offline when we we're talking before we tape this i have a very similar story and i have a similar motivation a similar passion for happiness as sort of the as an art as a something that can be mastered or taught as a skill uh because i had that same strange paradigm of being highly successful and highly unhappy and you sort of, when you are striving for these things, you think that when you get to, to this point of whatever you think success is, you will be full, you will be happy, you will be fulfilled, all of that thing, all of that. And it, and it disappoints usually, right? So mm-hmm. what is, what is, how did you experience that tension uh, mm. initially? I'm, I'm curious about your own story, I guess. Right. How did I experience the tension myself? Uh, so yes. rewind back to about 2006 or 2007. Um, I had just gotten tenure at the University of Texas at Austin. I don't know if you or your audience are familiar with this thing called tenure. But once you get tenure, you basically can't get fired. Um, so it's a big deal. Um, as a professor to get tenure, you have a lifetime of uh, job security, which is particularly in this day and age sounds um, so anachronistic almost uh who has that right job security for life um so it's a big deal and so i had tenure i had a beautiful family i had a great house um and everything and and good health uh and yet there was some sense of emptiness inside of me right so and not not that there was anything wrong with my life or anything in the way that i've led it that uh, clearly pointed me to you know oh, this is the reason why you're not as happy as you could be it was just this general sense of in Buddhism, they talk about, you know, the Buddha talking about a general sense of discontent, right? A general yeah. sense of dissatisfaction that seems to characterize much of human nature. And part of it can be explained um, by this phenomenon called hedonic adaptation, right? So yes. you beat that to things. And so, you know, let's take the example of a chocolate. The first bite tastes great. The second bite, not quite as great. The third bite, even less so and so on. By the time you get to the hundredth bite of a chocolate, it actually is aversive to you, right? So a similar thing could explain why the same things that brought you happiness the first time around, when you aim for that success, you were a musician, right? Um, and so when you kind of aim to have a successful song out there um, and it's successful, you, you're like, wow, you know, you, you, you become ecstatic. But then uh, a week, two or a month rolls around and then you're not so happy anymore. And now you need to kind of repeat that success and maybe even go higher than you did the last time around in terms of success for you to feel the same level of happiness. So that's hedonic adaptation. There's a little bit of that. I think that was a reason for my lack of fulfillment or happiness. But another part of it was that I think that I was also pursuing the wrong kinds of goals, right? So broadly speaking, you can think about what might be called extrinsic goals. These are external to you. So these are things like money and fame and power and adulation and all those things. And you can also think of intrinsic goals. These are goals that 
no matter where you live, no matter who you are, right, in, in terms of your status and position, these are things that give you happiness. So for example, for you, it might be playing music. For me, it could be, you know, writing a paper or, you know, playing a particular sport, things like that. And so I think that I had started to overemphasize and, and some of it without realizing it over the years, these extrinsic goals, and they seem to come at a cost to these pursuit of these intrinsic goals. So there's a kind of a dual explanation for my lack of uh, lack of happiness um, 15 years ago. Part of it was hedonic adaptation, but the other part was this you know, pursuit of wrong kinds of goals. So how did you switch? How did you, I guess, um... I'm trying to formulate the question correctly here for for those of us who are listening, uh, because I think many people face that same, I have achieved and yet I'm empty state. And yet you, you're not ready to necessarily make a shift or invest in enough of a, of a, of a decisive action to make a shift. Right. Um, and, and you're sort of live with it. You almost tolerate burnout. You tolerate, emptiness you tolerate it for a while until you can't tolerate it anymore and i guess my question is would be for me it was it was just it was just the intensity of misery you know mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know like the, there's a level where you go i'm unhappy i'm unhappy i'm happy i'm miserable mm -hmm. and then i'm desperate and then when i'm hit desperate that's when i go all right yeah. i'm gonna fix this thing uh, mm -hmm. how is that for you yeah so I don't know if I ever got to a point of desperation. Um, Good for you. Good for yeah. you. I'm happy for you. <laughs> you don't want to get there. Thank You're you. smarter yeah, than I, I was. Okay. Well, you know, in, in, a, in a, like a long-term, sustained, consistent sense, I never got to a point of desperation. I did have moments, rock bottom kind of moments yeah, that yeah. did not uh -huh. last very long. And I described one of such a rock bottom moment in um, a short article that I wrote. It's up on my website. I can share it with you and with the audience later on. Um, and I titled that particular uh, article, When the Bottom Fell Out. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. that's perfect. Yeah, when the bottom fell out. So um, I did have moments like those, uh, but I never got to a point where I was like clinically de depressed on, you know, uh, antidepressant medication or anything of that sort. But I had enough of a glimpse into it to realize that that is probably the worst situation you can have, you know? worse yeah. than having a fatal disease even, because at least if you have a fatal disease, but you're not depressed and you have hope, um, you can maximize the utility or enjoyment and be nice to other people in the amount of time that you have left on earth. Everyone's time is limited on earth, right? No yes, of course. No and and, and I, guess, I guess that's actually fascinating because uh, mm -hmm. for, for our audience here, mm -hmm. uh, my scenario was, uh, okay, unhappy, unhappy, miserable, desperate, then the change. Uh, mm -hmm. I would rather have, I would rather have been like you. So, mm -hmm. so as, as a, as a, can you unpack a little bit? How do you, how do you not allow m misery and desperation mm -hmm. to creep in before mm -hmm. you take decisive action? Like in, in your mm -hmm. situation, what was it? Was it an intellectual realization? Was it a mentor who said, bro, you're pursuing the wrong things? Mm -hmm. um, anything else? You're a spouse, mm -hmm. uh, a family situation? What was it? It's a great question, uh, Christian. So I think that is a combination of things. There's no one thing. So here's where I think tenure comes into the picture as well. You know, the whole idea of granting professors tenure, right? The system of tenure that we yes. have. It's, it's so amazing. That, it's amazing, right? I mean, so that the professors now, these are like you know, people who are good at thinking, no longer have to fear being jobless. So what mm -hmm. happens when you have that fear that, you need to earn the money in order to pay the bills, you could get fired, etc. is that it makes you become a little more um, safe in the kinds of things that you do. Um, yes. You don't necessarily pursue things that are a little bit left field or out of the ordinary, and you're not as creative and as risk taking as you might be if you're granted tenure. And so the tenure had a very big role to play in all of this. I'm in the marketing department of a business school, right? Yes. So, you, I would be expected to teach marketing courses, you know, totally makes sense. And that's what I was doing until I got tenure. And the tenure really freed me up to think beyond, you know, go outside the box, so to speak, um, beyond what it is that I would be normally expected to teach. And so that's when I thought, look, I've always been interested in the topic of happiness. 
I now recognize that I myself, I'm not as happy as I could or should be. And I have a lot of friends who are very wildly successful even um, in terms of conventional success, but they're not necessarily anywhere close to the level of happiness that they ought to be. And so this seems like an important thing to me, right? And I knew instinctively that everybody at some level or the other um, seeks happiness, right? I mean, maybe it might even be their most important goal, actually. And so I thought to myself, here I'm at, I am in the business school, giving my students skill sets and tools required to become successful in terms of wealth and fame and money and power and all that. But if in the end, they're not happy despite all of that, just like I've discovered for myself that I'm not as happy as I could be. And I've seen my friends achieve success, but not happiness. So isn't this an important topic that we should be discussing, right? So just like um, occurred to me. And so that thought, plus the fact that I had tenure, right? Um, plus the fact that I've always been interested in the topic of happiness, um, all of this put together just made me take one small step in that direction, right? So the next thing I did was to turn in a one-page description of what the course would be to my chair. And as it turned out, so you need the cooperation of the universe sometimes for things to happen, right? As it turned out, that particular chairperson would just temporarily come in to fill in for a couple of years, was very interested in the topic. And so he said, yes, you know, this is good. Had he not been that interested, he might have rejected it because why should a marketing professor offer a course on happiness, right? There's a very legitimate objection to my offering it. He could have rejected it. The dean's office could have rejected it. But every step of the way, it was a go, go, go. And then, of course, you know, once it got approved, I had to sit down and actually think about what it is that I'm going to say in the course because there wasn't a book on the topic. There's really nothing. No one is teaching a course on happiness, particularly in the business school um, 15 years ago. So that's how it began. So maybe this is a little bit disappointing, but I didn't really come to a break point. Uh, no, I no, it is, it's not actually. I think it's inspiring to me because I would rather I would rather uh, us, people who are strivers, people who are mm -hmm. ambitious, things like that, uh, not not have to go to like to hit rock bottom, right? Yeah, have to be yeah, yeah. that would sort of get signals from the universe, as you said, to change course ahead of time when you're feeling okay. This is not just not going in the right direction. I think it's yeah. the wiser thing to do. And uh, let me let me let me guess. Your mm -hmm. course, of course, was wildly popular. Yeah, the, so I launched two courses online. Okay. Uh, oh, you're talking about the course that I started teaching at the Macomb School. Of yes, Business? yes, yes. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the very first time that I taught it was in 2009, on the spring okay. of 2009, actually fall of 2009. I, this was to the undergrads. And uh, I got nominated for Professor of the Year Award. Um, the very first time that I taught that mm -hmm. course, you know, it had been like nine years since I'd been teaching at the University of Texas. Um, by the way, when I first had the idea to put the course together, maybe in 2006, 2007, to when I first started offering the course, it took me a good couple of years because, like I said, you know, there's no book on the topic. There's no syllabus out there that I could just like, look, I have to create the whole thing. Right. So it took yeah. me and a it's a relatively years. new discipline. Right. Uh, or area of interest. I think it was yeah. mm -hmm. it was sort of just taking off at the time. Yeah, I think uh, this area called positive psychology, right? It began in 1998 with this address that Martin Seligman made to, made mm -hmm. to the Psychological Association, and that's when it started. So it had been like merely 10 years since that field, new field started. Yeah, and it's so, a baby field, basically, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it still is uh, relatively new, uh, although it's remarkable how much it has grown in the, in the last like 20 years, 25 years. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm it's it's one it's remarkable that it's wonderful that it's here it's mm. remarkable that it's grown it's also remarkable how long it took for uh, an evolved civilization to uh, actually you know to to get to a point to p bring it to the forefront even though uh you can see glimpses of of these are core human mm -hmm. uh values um core mechanisms even with for human flourishing and you see teaching about this in all main ancient uh, uh, wisdom uh, literature, yeah. correct? Like I think you you mentioned Buddhism. I read the Bible. I've actually studied uh, Buddhism as well, and I was very much very curious about Eastern philosophy, especially early on in my 18, 20, 21, 22, sort of that range. Uh, but it's remarkable how... Do you find correlations like I do between mm -hmm. uh, research, data, uh, things that are absolutely proven to be true and the timeless wisdom literature that we have uh, in the human experience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of correlation. Uh, if you want to kind of like think about it at a very broad, uh, 
you know, bird's eye picture level, what are the recommendations that come from most of the old wisdom traditions and religions and spiritual traditions and what the science is saying now, uh, I would say that both would agree that, look, your happiness, what you feel is going to be a mixture of external environment cooperating with you and also the internal environment, you know, how you think about things, how you view things and so on. So the attitude that you bring to life, right? That turns out to be super important. Of course, most of the wisdom traditions and religions tend to work on the inside determinants, you know, the yeah, things that you- on the on the intrinsic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is broad agreement on that. Um, I think that even when you look at the external world and the things that contribute to your happiness in general, that um, most religions would say that, yeah, it is very important for you to maintain good relationships, right? Um, one of the big reasons why it's so important across re the religions, this recommendation of being kind and altruistic um, is because it's the right thing to do, sure, but also because it helps you build great relationships. When mm -hmm. you're nice to other people, other people in general, right, on average, tend to notice it and they want to do something nice in return to you because people are by nature fair, right? Um, at least they have a, like, a little bit of a fairness meter inside the, of their head somewhere. And so when they see you do good things to them, they want to do good things in return. And that sets you up for a good, virtuous, reciprocal relationship that's upwardly spiraling, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's very important. The idea of being able to kind of control your mind and regulate your thoughts is super important in religions. And it turns out to be super important when you look at the literature here. The mm -hmm. one big difference, I would say, between religion, uh, religions and religious recommendations and Science would be in terms of um, this idea of mastery and in terms of achieving things and stuff like yeah. that, and setting goals. Um, so in general, I think that in the in the literature, or in the science, um, there's a lot of evidence showing that all of those things are important for us to be happy. Um, well, but, you know, in, bi in biblical wisdom, that's very important as a matter of no, fact. Very important. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, the... Um, the success of, of the economic success of, of, of America is largely mm. attributed to the, to the Protestant work ethic, which is directly mm. connected to a faith mm. framework around work, right? Mm. A framework of ex like serving, uh, you work as you so serve God, mm. you, uh, you also work as to serve human beings as a spiritual practice, not just as a mechanical or commercial practice. Um, Jewish tradition actually confirms that really well. I think the Christians have actually lost that quite a mm -hmm. bit compared to the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and then even if, if you look at the Old Testament, there's tons of stuff like that mm -hmm. that is uh, that put, puts an emphasis on excellence. Mm -hmm. And um, there's Proverbs and Psalms and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So there's, there's a lot in the biblical literature that, that puts work um, as a spiritual practice on the, for, on the forefront as well. Mm, that's great. Yeah. So even in Hinduism, you know, I'm born into a Hindu family. I'm myself not necessarily very religious, um, but there is an a, a emphasis on work and work being important. It's called karma, right? Karma is uh, mm -hmm. actually people kind of, you know, one of the um, definitions of karma is the cycle, right? Action has a reaction kind of a thing, but really originally karma means work. And there's a lot of emphasis on it. So I didn't mean in that kind of a broad sense of work as a divine endeavor. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean more in the narrow sense of identifying something that aligns with your set, particular set of strengths and your aptitudes. Right. And yes, yes, yes. Having mm -hmm. a kind of I get clear it. roadmap of how you want to kind of achieve your potential in terms of mm -hmm. uh, you know, earlier, you were talking a little bit about this idea of uh, happiness as a value, right? Um, so, you know, you can kind of like extend that to also talk about uh, what are your set of aptitudes and values? So some people have a love for learning. Other people have, um, you know, interest in music. Still others might have interest in, say, sports and th things like that. And so discovering who you are, what your aptitudes are, and then finding the best avenues for you to nurture those talents. You know, I mean it in that kind of way. Sure, sure. Do you think perhaps that that, that dimension of work is not present in the ancient in ancient literature, mm. uh, primarily because in those times you just didn't choose as much. You didn't have that kind of freedom of of vocation. You choose your profession. You do what your father did, right? And yeah. the father and his father did before him. Mm. Do you think that might have something to do with it, or is it is it just not there? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I do think that uh, I hadn't thought of that. I do think that that's a very valid reason for why that may not have existed. 
I also think that there's an element of, um, at least in some of the Eastern religions, you know, I'm not that familiar with uh, the um, Judeo-Christian uh, mm -hmm. traditions as much, but um, at least in the Eastern religions, there is an element almost of um, kind of giving up desires or giving up goals. Or yeah. Not having goals uh -huh. Uh -huh. That, uh, you know, seems to be. I think so, of, too. Yeah. Uh -huh. I would agree with that. Yeah. And there's, a, I think, uh, in, and that's probably a big shift from uh, the Judea, the, the Jewish tradition is mm. much more integrated. Mm -hmm. And then the, I think the Christian tradition, in from what I can understand, was heavily influenced by the Platonic, the Greek thought of, mm. you know, basically, the soul is valuable, the body is not, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, mm. you know, all those dual, the duality uh, mm -hmm. teachings, where mm. you you don't see as much emphasis of an on an integrated life in the Christian uh, mm. tradition. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with not even with the scriptures itself, but how mm. the direction that the church and culture took mm. naturally, mm. Be, uh, that is not even connected to scriptures per se, it's just mm. a mix of cultures, influences, philosophies, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, but it, I think it's true. I think you're absolutely right. And I think mm. maybe it seems to me that the Protestant, uh, the, branch. The, the, the Protestant branch mm. recaptured some of that, mm, uh, I okay. uh, integrated, an, a, a more integrated um, approach to life where work actually, work actually matters, your mm. physical sort of body actually matters, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And actually agency, personal mm. agency matters. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, there's the uh, teachings are such a mix of of cultures and influences and and even yeah. politics. You know, it, it it all has an imprint on the way uh, we end up thinking about life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. But back to your question, yeah. I mean, I think that by and large, there's a strong agreement across all of these things. Mm -hmm. The other area in which I think maybe the science kind of branches out a little bit from religion is uh, with regard to uh, the role that um, some of the psychedelics might play. Um, ah, so okay. Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca. So this is like, if you think about ayahuasca, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you know, the, I am somewhat. Yeah. yeah, I haven't yeah. practiced it, but yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So neither have I. I'm very curious. Uh, but you know, so some of those things are, you're kind of like um, taking plant based medicine, sometimes they call it, um, in order to have revelations and in order to expand your mind and in order to kind of have a spiritual experience that opens up your eyes to what's possible. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of science seems to now kind of back up uh, some of those practices. Uh, if you think about psilocybin, for example, which is the active ingredient in mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of these are, you know, neurotransmitters and hormones that are present in our bodies in low quantities, or they're only secreted at certain special times, like DMT, for example, is secreted when you're born and when you die. And mm -hmm. I work, uh, one of the act big active ingredients is DMT. And so it's artificially, in a sense, infusing something that you only get to otherwise experience when, you know, mm -hmm. this when you're coming into Earth or when you're leaving Earth. And so things like that also seem to now have some backing from scientists in terms of uh, being good for expanding your horizons and seeing a spiritual side to life and therefore being a happier person. Yeah, you know, I'm not surprised at all, actually. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because you, uh, I think that actually, even even that correlates with uh, some ancient practices, because you know, um, you know, in Buddhism, you're you want to achieve Nirvana, which mm -hmm. is which is sort of a state of almost like a zoomed out state where you see the big picture rather than you see yourself mm -hmm. as the center of everything right um mm -hmm. i was actually teaching just on sunday uh at, a, at the church that i that i preach at um mm -hmm. in tribe here about uh, the story of the apostle peter praying mm -hmm. on the roof of, of a building mm -hmm. and it says in the story that he fell into a trance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he actually fell into a trance and had a vision a very mm -hmm. like if if you wouldn't be if you detach sort of the scripture and people wouldn't be mm -hmm. um sort of f familiar with the with with mm -hmm. the story they would think he would he was having a trip so because it was a psychedelic thing like he, it, it, the, the the vision is described very specifically there's a, mm -hmm. a mantle that comes from heaven and there's all these animals and some of them mm -hmm. are kosher animals the other ones are forbidden to eat and the mm -hmm. a voice tells him kill and eat 
and mm. he's shocked, he's puzzled because he's not supposed to eat certain animals. Mm. And the whole thing was there accompanied by a real physical interaction with uh, a centurion, uh, a one day travel from him getting a mm. visit as well. And he's mm. basically saying, go find Peter because you want to join the Christian mm. movement. And of course, for that whole mantle thing for Peter was a, a permission to include a non-Jewish person into his faith. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, not only was he a non-Jewish person, he was a, a member of a Roman a military commander in an occupying army. Can you imagine that, right? Like wow. it doesn't he doesn't strike you as a as a as a friend. And yet so the psychedelic like vision was there uh, was ne probably needed because otherwise mm -hmm. Peter probably wouldn't have said yes to this. Mm -hmm to mm -hmm. convince him of this expanded vision for his life, mm -hmm. for his faith, all mm -hmm. of that stuff. Anyway, I'm just mentioning it as an interesting mm -hmm. parallel here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to ask you this. You mentioned in one of your talks, I, 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 th I thought it was fascinating th that research shows on one hand mm -hmm. that um, Wherever you go, it's it's not just an American thing, the pursuit of happiness. Wherever mm. you go, people across the cultures, geographies, that's what they want. Like in the in the top, in the 80, 90 percent level of of priorities, right? Mm. Um, you mentioned that. And at the same time, it, what they do, they want this, but they pursue, they want something that is intrinsic, only caused by intrinsic uh, reasons and sort of practices, I guess, right? Or qualities, mm -hmm. probably the best mm -hmm. word. Um, but what they actually pursue <laughs> primarily mm -hmm. is extrinsic, like fame, money, possessions, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and can you explain why? I mean, why do we want, why do we need happiness? Mm -hmm. We need to be happy. But mm -hmm. we actually want and pursue and over invest in fame, mm -hmm. money, accolades, achievements, mm -hmm. tenure, respect, you know, all of that stuff, a bigger house, a better car. Yeah, yeah. No, it's an interesting uh, question. I think that, you know, there's two big reasons for it. One is that, in fact, fame and money and power and all of these things can give you a little bit of a boost in happiness levels, as I'm sure that you have discovered or other people that are listening to this have discovered themselves is that when you get that bonus check in the mail, right? Or IRS refunds you or something, um, you do actually experience a little bit of a boost in your happiness. Most people do, most normal people do. And so um, if that is true, then what you your subconscious brain ends up thinking is, okay, getting that $2,000 check uh, in the mail, give me a boost of happiness, then it must mean that money makes me happier. The only problem is that it makes you happy in the moment and, you know, fast forward a month um, or not even a month, maybe a week, you're totally forgotten about that money, right? You probably spent it or wherever it is, it no longer gives you that boost in happiness levels. But your subconscious brain has learned the link between getting a boost in money and a boost in happiness levels. And therefore, it thinks that money makes you happier. Same thing with pain. Same thing and, as and that's And that's the hedonic adaptation phenomenon, correct? Well, that's what you're the, speaking no, of. It, it's a, so... The, the first part of it is not hedonic adaptation. When you do get that money and you receive a boost in happiness levels, that's not hedonic adaptation. That's You've not just... adapted the money yet. Right? right. But a week passes uh, or a month passes and then you've gotten adapted to that money and you, it no longer makes you happy. Right. But why do we pursue money? Why do we pursue this, uh, this fame and power, etc.? It's because our brain has learned that it does deliver a boost in happiness levels. The problem is it doesn't deliver a sustained boost in happiness levels. So, so, hap so happiness makes us happy. It oh, just happiness? doesn't... Yeah, or, 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 right, money makes us happier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, possessions make us happier, but it doesn't make us as happy as we, ex as we think it will, and it doesn't stay, keep us happy as long as we think, correct? Right, right. exactly. Oh. Okay. So okay. That, that's one reason for it is that we have just learned over time that, you know, just like a puppy dog might learn over time that, look, you know, sit or a command like sit is associated with a treat, right? And yes. then you can take the treat away after the hundredth time, it'll sit because the brain has learned that sit means I'm going to get a treat, right? Yes. So the brain is already kind of secreting some of the dopamine and everything that it's expecting now because of the treat and it just sits. 
So in a similar way, like we are like dogs at some level, you know, we just get see money. We it gave us a boost in happiness levels, and now we just keep chasing money. Yeah, yeah. Might stop giving us happiness levels. Yeah. Okay. And, and the second big reason is what other people do, right? We are hugely social as a species, um, and yes. so we observe other people, and we think that people are not stupid at some level. They're doing things for a reason, and so we mimic other people. And so if everyone around us is telling us that money, 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 you know, go after money. And then you see like, um, even if they don't do it explicitly, implicitly, you see people with money on the covers of Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine and on, you know, people and CNN and Fox News, then you think, oh, there must be something to this, right? So if people can't all be stupid. And so everyone's chasing money, fame, power, then why am I not? So you get caught up in that rat race. I think it's like- Yeah, and especially if you don't have it and you see the picture yeah. and you don't have it, you go, well, maybe I'll be happy when I have what they have, right? So. 100%, 100%, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I think part of it is also social. What you, what you mentioned is the, 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 the pursuit of the extrinsic um, approval of people, right? Fame, respect, status, all of those, all of that dimension of the extrinsic. We pursue them because we are tribal people. We're, mm -hmm. we're wired for to fit in to it, it communicates to us on a biological level on some level mm -hmm. um, that this there's value in this right so can you uh, what what is your research or your insight in, into this mm. so uh so, so sorry can, can you repeat the question so mm. we we so let's say we pursue three pursuits that under deliver uh, uh, consistently right mm -hmm. so we pursue money possessions right mm -hmm. we pursue fame Mm -hmm. and let's say status so it's all social approval stuff and then we pursue a pleasure correct uh, that's mm -hmm. another thing so with the fame and status and approval and accolades and sh how does that why is that so strong as an instinct almost as a primal thing for us yeah so i think that if you were to kind of rewind back to our evolutionary past, right? Where we used to live in tribes of 100, 150 people, something like this. I don't know if you've heard of something called the Dunbar number. I have, yes. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, the church that I planted called Tribe specifically mm -hmm. is designed so that when we go over 150 people, we split mm -hmm. and send out a new church oh, because wow. of the Dunbar number. Yeah, so a little, a little side note there. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. So, um, Back in that um, evolutionary past, when we used to live in these villages and tribes and everything, um, the closer you were to somebody who was powerful, right, the chief of the village, mm -hmm. um, the more likely it is that you would survive, right, if there was a war or a famine or something like that. So back in that evolutionary past, it did matter for something very important to us, which was survival, how we stacked up relative to other people. So this is not a shallow need to be pursuing power or fame or status, et cetera, because our brain is learned and mm -hmm. we are the program of our ancestors. And so there is a little bit of that in our hard wiring that when you achieve power, when you achieve fame, when you achieve status, um, you are going, you're actually increasing your chances of surviving. Yeah. yeah. This is a very important reason why we pursue it. The only problem is that look around nobody really is in danger of not being able to survive right precisely nobody yeah. is in danger of being chased by lions and tigers or not having the next square meal or what have you right we are in fact in a situation in which survival has been taken out of the equation altogether and yet right. we're behaving as if survival were at risk and so we pursue the very things in the in our evolutionary past that used to increase our chances of surviving when really the name of the game these days is not surviving it's flourishing it's thriving that's a totally different end goal. that's one that's a great insight so it's not survival it's flourishing yeah. and the, and then i would love to talk to you about practices that make that help us make make the switch from mm -hmm. something so evolutionary and so primal for lack of a better mm -hmm. word into mm -hmm. something more into sort of a thought pattern or mm -hmm. practices or habits that are really geared up they're proactive towards flourishing not reactive towards survival which is not mm -hmm. even a real thing these days right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm very curious about that yeah yeah so i think that you basically need to kind of realize that at some level that look our, the name of the game is not surviving it's flourishing and then uh, you need to think through, okay, then what does it mean in terms of how I react to things? And so what it means is that 
whatever advantages that you might have gotten in that evolutionary past by becoming wealthier or more famous or more powerful, those advantages no are not as significant anymore. The only advantages left are that other people are going to like you better or you know put you up on a pedestal. They don't don't really really like you at a deep level just because you're powerful. They just feel like you're somebody that they ought to get to know so that they can then also by association become more powerful or whatever. So that's definitely an advantage that remains. But as far as surviving is concerned, your greater power, et cetera, is not going to do anything. It's not going to move the needle. Once you realize that and you realize that, okay, what I want out of my life is to flourish, is to thrive, is to be happy, then it really calls for this mental switch from being scarcity oriented because mm. Scarcity orientation is what promotes chances of surviving, right? You're holding, you're protecting your own things, you're distrusting of other people because who knows, somebody might turn out to be evil and backstab you, et cetera. Um, and in that process, what you're doing is that you're denying yourself opportunities to have new experiences, to go out of your familiar boundaries, to make friends with somebody who looks a little bit different from you and so on and so forth. So that's what a scarcity mindset does is that it closes you in, it increases mm. the of surviving but reduces the chances of thriving and so you need to make the switch from a scarcity mindset to an abundant mindset where you feel like you know what i have enough i have yes. not just enough i have more than enough my survival is not at stake anymore how can i look for ways in which i can help other people out or not really be so self-focused and um you know self-centered and uh, not pursue these extrinsic goals and really pursue my intrinsic goals and my passions because you know, it's it's worth pursuing extrinsic goals if you don't have money and your survival is at stake. But once that's taken out of the equation, it's so much better to pursue your intrinsic goals and your intrinsic passions. And so I think you mentioned can... something along those lines when you speak about superior superiority seeking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that it actually it's it's a it's a major motivator to many of us. I would even include myself in that, especially early on when I was young and stupid where you're it's, everything is a competition and i look back and i go oh my gosh i would have made so much uh, better decisions and made more friends and actually collaborated with very talented people i <laughs> admired if i wasn't trying to compete against them all the time right uh but you actually mentioned that in one of your talks where that that superiority seeking as a sort of mindset mm -hmm. uh, is somewhat related seems to to scarcity mindset and it actually deters happiness and success right is that Absolutely. is that accurate am i reading this correctly from what 100%, you were saying 100 and so if you actually think about the scarcity mindset it does like at least three things one is that it makes you pursue superiority because you're operating out of scarcity and you think therefore that for me to win somebody else has to lose so it becomes very hierarchical the way that you look at things rather than horizontal so when you look at things horizontally you think oh that person's interested in music i'm interested in sports uh, you know different people are different and you know let's appreciate and celebrate the celebrate the diversity when you look at it vertically then you stack everybody up or below yourself right so that's one so you chase superiority when you're scarcity oriented you also become more self-centered. And so you want to be the receiver of love and nurturing and kindness and compassion from other people, rather than thinking of yourself as an agent of kindness and compassion that can help other people out. So you become more self-centered with regard to relationships. So superiority, superiority seeking and then a desperation for love is another um, manifestation of a scarcity mindset. And the third manifestation of a scarcity mindset is the sense of like, wanting control over the external world um so you ah, become very overly control seeking of other people and over uh, outcomes and so you become very unhappy if things don't go your way rather than surrendering to the universe like an abundance oriented person might do and say that look what i wanted this i did not get it how fascinating right beautiful so the universe did not cooperate let me kind of dance with the universe now and find out why it is that it did not get what it did not get right so learning from those things becomes more likely if you're abundance oriented I think that dimension, what you just mentioned, also uh, greatly affects your ability to lead other people in teams and companies if you're trying to build a business. Look, if you want to control the, the environment too much, you're going to make a lot of people unhappy. You're going to mm -hmm. not keep good, talented people around you. They're, they're not going to stick around. And talented people are not going to be, you know, want to be part of your team in the first place, right? Because mm -hmm. you're you're controlling too much, correct? Don't you think that's uh, pro probably correlates with even uh, the some failure and some weakness in leadership when you're trying to lead a team? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So 
that's one of the big negatives of being overly control seeking is that you basically transmit to the people around you that it's my way or the highway, right? Yeah. And people who are really talented, who have independence of thought, who actually can contribute new ideas. You know, the best ideas happen, Christian, as I'm sure you've noticed in your collaborations as well, you know, musically or otherwise, when there's diversity of thought and diversity yes, of, of course. Yeah. Then you have to resolve them. And then that's when the new kind of innovative things happen. If everybody thinks exactly the same, then you're going to do the same things, right? And so mm -hmm. as a leader, you're absolutely spot on that if you're very control seeking, then other people around you are not going to be very happy. And you can even see it in like two year olds, actually. Right. So yeah. they want to do something. They want to go poke their fingers into an electricity outlet or they want to kind of like, you know, um, use a knife and then you start to control them. Then they react against it. They become upset and they start crying. Right. Mm -hmm. Teenagers are another example. You've been through that phase and I'm right now going through that. Uh, where they want to forge their independence. And so when you try to be overly control seeking, they revolt against it, right? They show you attitude. And mm -hmm. this is called psychological reactance in the literature. So when you try to control other people, they exhibit psychological reactance. And so because having great relationships is so important for us as human beings, when we try to control other people, we mm -hmm. don't really get back love. And so, you know, you can have your control, right? You're going to tick that box in terms of making you happier, but then you're going to lose out on love and connection with other people. That's mm -hmm. going to definitely lower your happiness levels. And the best approach is to um, have the sense of internal peace and internal control, as I call it, right? You have control over your own mind, over your own feelings. So no matter what, you can be equanimous and you can be mature and you can be pleasant. And when you operate out of that foundation of internal control, mm -hmm. then other people naturally want you to give them advice. They naturally see you as a leader. They want um, opinions or suggestions from you. And so you can get to have control over them, uh, although the word control in this context is probably not, not the right word, but you get to be a leader, you get to be a visionary, you get to be persuasive, um, but not uh, coming from a state of desperation of, you know, my happiness lies in other people obeying me, but rather those people, other people wanting you to lead them, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. being flavor of the whole thing so you do get external control but you have to start with internal control and once you have a sufficiently high level of internal control people can see and yeah yeah have that. that's great uh, can you speak a little bit in uh, as a tangent to that um, mm -hmm. on our our profound need to belong and uh, more specifically I guess in the context of a, a developed uh, the developed country, the a Western sort of culture where we have the upsides of being, of having mobility, geographic mobility, socioeconomic mobility. On a, the downside, uh, we're more and more disconnected, right? So we're more atomic as people. So we are very individualistic people. Mm -hmm. And that, not, that I think, um, plays a trick on us. Uh, because we can be modern, we can be Western oriented, we could be successful, upwardly mobile. And yet the, the need to belong um, to a tribe, to a community, to a family and be connected at a deeper level doesn't go away just because we belong to this particular culture. So how do we navigate that as, as mm -hmm. people who are sort of swimming in these waters, for, for lack of a mm. better word? Mm. Yeah, it's a very important question, Christian. And I think that one of the things that happened with me, I don't know if any of the audience can relate to this, is um, because of COVID, there was a positive outcome which happened with me, which is that I wasn't able to travel anymore as much, right? And I had to teach classes from inside my home office. This is the home office I built because of COVID. And um, as it turned out, we also acquired a dog, like a lot of people did during COVID. In fact, he's lying down right here. Uh, oh, <laughs> love it. Uh -huh. So um, I really connected with my neighborhood and my neighbors. And, you know, I, I used to go on long walks uh, around my neighborhood and I started noticing the trees and the plants. And, you know, I started noticing the change of seasons and the bird building its nest and laying eggs and then the little birds flying off and everything. All of these things started unfolding, which is not at all a strange and unusual experience uh, for a vast majority of human beings uh, in our existence as a species. Um, I think that, in fact, for a vast time uh, in our existence as a species, we probably, this was the more common thing, is to be in one situation, one locality, maybe a radius of about 20 kilometers, 
um, and uh, know everybody in that neighborhood, every tree, every little you know landscape feature in that neighborhood, and really connect with it, right? Uh, and that's so 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 important for us to be happy. And so, in a way, you know, if you think about the recipe for a happy life, it's actually very simple. You don't need a whole lot to be very happy. You need enough money to or resources, access to resources to be able to, um, you know, feed yourself and your family. You need um, some level of control and autonomy over uh, the environment, and there two resources can help, which is why you see any positive correlation between money and happiness is because of that. I would say more than anything else, right? Um, and you need um, good quality relationships, right? Tight connections with your family, with your friends, with a close knit group. If you have all of this, really, I mean, like you're already ninety percent of the way there. Okay, you of course need to work on your mind and you work, need to work on your physical health and so on. We don't need a whole lot more. And unfortunately, I think what has happened is that in a way, like you put it very well, right? It's a double-edged sword, this thing called advancement um, and progress. So on the one hand, you get your menu of items opened up. You can do a lot more. You can go to Russia if you want. You can go to India. You can travel around the world. You can you know, go see the Borora, um, Aurora Borealis actually in, in, in person. But it comes at a cost to forging these intimate, deep relationships and to connecting with the earth around you and getting to know a particular geographical area at a deeper level where you're aligned and harmonious with the seasons, right? Forget about traveling. I mean, even being able to get mangoes in the peak of winter, right, which is a tropical fruit that grows in the summer in India, is like, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Okay, it's fine. You know, you're getting to eat something that you had a craving for when you shouldn't be getting it. But... You know, it's also depriving the enjoyment that you get uh, when you have to wait for it, right? And there's a little bit of yeah. thing. Yeah, so it's a very interesting point. I think. It really is. And I think it comes down to all of the things that we, you and I discussed today. It comes down to just maybe nurturing a, a higher awareness uh, to not be as reactive as, as most people are, or as all of us tend to be. Mm -hmm. And just knowing this, these are the things that harm me. These are the things that help me flourish mm -hmm. and creating s sort of systems and patterns and, you know, rituals, I guess, uh, to promote those things. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's like, I guess, like you could call it three stages, right? The first stage is to kind of even realize that a life of leading, uh, leading a life of happiness and fulfillment is important. Right. Yeah. I think that's very important. And for some people, they have to be pushed into misery and other people, I guess, are somewhat luckier enough to like me to um, start to prioritize that even without having that, you know, huge misery experience. The second step is to then make a list of things that um, look like reasonable things to put on a list that increase your happiness levels, you know, and now you can kind of like look at the scientific evidence on it. Of course, it's very good to also go back to the wisdom traditions and so, for example, you might discover that, okay, having a sense of faith is very important. Um, mm -hmm. Having a sense of community is very important. Um, keeping regular hours is very important. Maybe not lying and cheating is very important and so on and so forth. Make a list. And the third step is to then like practice these things. And some of these things are going to be difficult right, to do. So, for example, if you're used to eating unhealthy stuff and you get a report from your doctor saying that, oh, you got like, you know, plaque buildup in your arteries, you better change your diet, right? Yeah. Um, and now those might be difficult because you're used to a certain kind of a diet or certain things give you pleasure. And so, you know, all of these, I think, are important milestones. And in terms of developing these rituals, as they called it, right, you can call them habits too. Um, that's where I think most of the action is, that if you can somehow build a bunch of habits that are consistent mm -hmm. and productive in your life, then the beautiful thing about habits is you don't have to think about them anymore. You know, exactly. You don't think about brushing your teeth. And so if you're by nature an abundance oriented person, or by nature, somebody who gravitate toward things that give you a sense of intrinsic enjoyment rather than money, fame, power, if you're by nature, a kind and um, big hearted person, if you're by nature, somebody who takes internal control rather than seeks external control, then really, I mean, you know, you're like 80, 90% of your happiness is already there for you. And the the bonus thing, I guess, uh, that success follows happiness as well, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, which, which is a, which is a remarkable finding, I think. It's it's good to know that that re there's extensive research confirming those things, right? So you can you can become very miserable pursuing success, 
and then actually lose your success. Mm -hmm. And instead of that, what you should be pursuing is happiness, because that will actually bring you success that is sustainable. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a beautiful thing too, right? I mean, it's like a win-win actually, because what you want out of life is happiness. And the reason why you were pursuing success is for that happiness. So if instead you say, okay, you know, if I want happiness in the end, why not focus on happiness to begin with? Then as a byproduct, you get success, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Definition of a win-win, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you, if you were to give... Do you have any books that you give away that you would go either recommend or just say, okay, mm. here's here's a book, uh, this mm. is going to change your life. Do you have any list, one book, three books, five books that mm. you would share with the with our audience here? Yeah, I think there's lots of books out there. And, you know, depending on the season, you're going to get a different book recommendation out of me. Yeah. Right now, I would say that Atomic Habits, since we talked about habits and mm -hmm. you know, Atomic Habits, I don't know if you've read it. It's by a guy yes. called James Clear. Um, James Clear, yes, I'm, I'm aware of that one. It's a fantastic book, yes, highly mm -hmm. recommended as well. So, mm -hmm. Recommended. And the good thing about that book is, you know, that it really digs a little bit deeper into how mm -hmm. to form habits. So you really have to forge your sense of identity. Who am I, right? Who do I want to be? See? Who, how do I want to see myself? Yeah. Am I an athlete? Am I a, um, you know, a, a, a Christian, a true Christian, whatever? You know, you, you mm -hmm. start with your identity. Once you start with your identity, then the habits become easier to adopt. Right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Change your identity uh, in some cases, at least. So that's one book I would recommend. Uh, since we talked about being loving, kind, giving, etc., this book uh, called um, Give and Take by Adam Grant. Oh, um, interesting. I haven't read that one. Give and Take. Yeah, he talks about givers and takers and matchers and how givers end up um, succeeding more, even in conven conventional terms, than do takers or matchers. So um, that's another book that I would highly recommend. Um, I think that uh, given your own kind of, you know, interest in uh, faith and Christianity, Christian, and I imagine that a lot of the people listening to this might um, be followers, um, people who follow you and therefore also inclined toward those things. Um, I would also suggest a man's search for meaning. Uh, Victor um, Frankel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say, I think that that would be an interesting book. Or, yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. That's great. Those uh, two out two out of three I've read the the Adam Grant I haven't yet, but thank you for that one as well. Sure. That's wonderful. Well, Raj, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on, and uh, uh, we'll we'll include some of your links in the show notes as well, so you guys can follow Raj. Uh, but thank you for the for the work you're doing. I'm so glad you're in Austin, uh, and uh, so we we actually live probably 15 minutes maybe 20 maximum from each other mm -hmm, i'm mm -hmm. trying to calculate from belterra to circle c mm -hmm. um but um but thank you again yeah. for coming it's been absolute an absolute pleasure and joy absolutely christian thank you very much for having me it was an absolute pleasure from my end as well and since you already calculated the distance maybe we should meet up one of these days i think we will i think we should <laughs>